Laryngopharyngeal reflux is better known as LPR, and it has become a very popular diagnosis in the last 30 years. Initially, we, back in the 80s, 70s, 60s, used to see people with vague throat symptoms, and we were just happy to make sure that they didn't have anything terrible going on like throat cancer. We didn't really have an explanation for why people had all these symptoms. And then in the 90s, there became this big interest in reflux, that is acid coming up from the stomach and affecting the throat. So much so that it's one of the commonest diagnoses in ENT these days. Uh, and when a GP sees somebody with vague throat symptoms, they will invariably discuss whether to start them on treatment for reflux or not, the medications for doing that. We don't really understand how many people actually get LPR and what the exact effect is on the throat. We do know that if uh, you have uh, stomach contents that hang around in the throat, then they are likely to cause damage, particularly if the contents are very acidic. This is most likely to occur at night time because at night time, we might belch or burp, or there might be a little bit of leakage, maybe through a weak sphincter at the bottom of the esophagus. And it then lies around in the throat all night because we don't tend to swallow very much when we're asleep at night. And so that's a potential area in which these things can cause damage. But such fluid tends to be very weakly acidic. And if it's weakly acidic, the chances of it damaging are very low. So our concepts of what LPR actually is are rapidly evolving now. And, and this is really in partnership with gastroenterologists who are starting to understand the importance of changes in the bacterial flora of the bowel and how that can affect not just the local part of the bowel, but the whole bowel, the whole system, and even the way we feel, whether we get depression or tired or whatever. So I think we have to keep watching this space and seeing exactly what is LPR, where is it coming from? But in simple terms, it's acid or stomach contents coming up and chronically affecting the throat and causing a mixture of symptoms. Uh, there's a, a, a substantial area of overlap between classical gastroesophageal reflux disease and throat symptoms. Uh, but it's certainly not a, a perfect correlation. They don't completely overlap. So... People with classic gastroesophageal reflux disease will get heartburn. Their symptoms will be made better by having a low acid diet, by taking anti-acid uh, med medications, especially things called proton pump inhibitors um, or um, alginates that will sit on the stomach contents and calm things down. So classic reflux is generally very well managed in those ways. Um, in order to make sure that's happening, people have to have an endoscopy by a gastroenterologist or a GI surgeon as well. Um, but it's very well understood what, what it is and what the effects are and what the treatments are. There are surgical options too. However, actually working out what is going on in LPR is far more difficult. Um, typical symptoms might be hoarseness, chronic cough, uh, definitely. Um, feeling of a lump in the throat or a tightness in the throat, a feeling of an acid taste or metallic taste in the throat, a lot of throat clearing, uh, sometimes even chronic pain in the throat. All of these things are often ascribed to LPR, where the acid is not just affecting the esophagus, as in classic gastroesophageal reflux, but is coming up and affecting the throat as well. So if if acid or stomach contents does access the top part of the throat, its effects can be quite damaging. Uh, it's well known that they can cause erosion of the back of the teeth, but the voice box in particular and the area around it are very vulnerable um, tissues. They are not designed to protect themselves from acid. Uh, in the same way that the stomach is, for example. And so even small amounts can cause, in effect, long-term low-grade burning and, and scarring and swelling. And these give rise to the other symptoms of chronic cough, um, lump in the throat, voice change, and so on. So if we're presented with somebody who we think might have LPR, 
the first thing to do is to be able to actually physically look at the throat. So we take a full history and then the way of looking at the throat is usually with a very small telescope that's passed into the nose and gives us a bird's eye view of the throat from above. So it isn't going deeply down to the throat. It's just going into the nose and looks around the corner. And we often give people a little bit of local anaesthetic spray to the nose, but not always. And the whole procedure takes no more than about three minutes. Uh, it feels a bit like a COVID test, but it's not as bad as a COVID test. Uh, and often we try and video this and actually show people what we're seeing as we're going as we're going along. So typically with a, a nasendoscopy, if people do have laryngopharyngeal reflux or LPR, what we will see is inflammation of the voice box and the tissues around it. And there's a standardized scoring system that can be used to measure this. But it's very subjective. It's very observer based. Um, and there's not a great consensus between ENT doctors about exactly what signs in the throat really do represent LPR. However, if you have somebody who has throat symptoms that you think might be due to um, uh, reflux coming up, particularly if they've got ex uh, coexisting actual heartburn and gastroesophageal reflux, maybe they're responding well to anti-reflux medication already or change in diet, um, then it's probably a fair bet that that is what's going on. And our first approach then would be to give people um, anti-reflux medications. However, if you're really not sure, and if, if people have actually had anti-reflux medications that they either haven't got on with or haven't really worked that well, then you do have to do some more gold standard testing. And the two ways of doing this are to refer to a gastroenterologist or upper GI surgeon who will do an upper GI endoscopy and have a look down um, at the stomach and the esophagus um, and the top part of the esophagus just to see exactly what's going on. Is there any classical reflux or any evidence of damage higher up? It's also best combined with uh, what we call 24-hour uh, pH impedance testing and manometry. Now, this is a battery of physiology tests that look into the way that the gullet is working. Um, a probe, a very, very fine probe is passed down into uh, the gullet and that stays in for 24 hours and communicates with a little box that sits on the outside um, by what's called telemetry, Bluetooth as we know it. And this will measure whether any reflux events are actually occurring throughout a 24 hour cycle. So when you're awake, when you're eating, when you're active, when you're sleeping, all of those things. And if such an event occurs, uh, does it correlate with actual symptoms? If people have, for example, a, a bout of coughing, then they can press a button on the box and that can be correlated with uh, when um, whether or not acid is actually uh, coming up into the esophagus. It tells us lots of other things too. For example, um, is what is coming up from the stomach acid or non-acid? Um, because even non-acidic reflux can cause changes uh, and also measures all the pressures in, in the gullet and the esophagus as well. So is there very low pressure at the bottom of the esophagus, which would actually let the acid come out? So those 24 hour physiology tests combined with an endoscopy would be the gold standard for people in whom we aren't sure whether they've got LPR or not. A lot of people, however, don't want to go down those routes. And for them, we would do a trial of treatment as the diagnostic test. And that's usually what's called proton pump inhibitors. Indiscriminate use of proton pump inhibitors, however, is not recommended because they can have long term side effects such as osteoporosis and they can alter the way in which other medications are absorbed as well. And, and so we would perhaps as a first line work on dietary changes, lifestyle changes and using alginates, which aren't particularly toxic and you can just sit on the stomach contents and help people that way. So trial of treatment would be, you know, the, the way that we'd approach diagnosis in the majority of people who don't want to go down the more convoluted methods, um, but gold standard methods of 24 hour monitoring and uh, gastroscopy. So actually the vast majority of people with these this vague constellation of throat symptoms, um, the chronic cough, the um, voice change, uh, the feeling of a lump in the throat, the vast majority actually don't have true reflux. But we would still, because it's easy to do, we would probably still give them a short trial 
um, of anti-reflux medication. And this is usually uh, what's called a proton pump inhibitor, given once or twice a day, about half an hour to 40 minutes before meals, because it doesn't work if you have uh, a full stomach. Um, it's not absorbed properly under those circumstances. Uh, and often in combination with an alginate, such as Gaviscon and Advance, which is taken uh, a couple of teaspoons after meals, three times a day, plus before bed. We'd all combine that with advice on lifestyle change and dietary change, low acid diet. And there are books such as Jamie Kaufman's book, Dropping Acid, which will um, help you inform your lifestyle and dietary changes as well. So, so that would be the mainstay of treatment for, for a lot of people. Um, if that isn't working and we feel that there is substantial evidence of actual reflux causing a problem, we might want to confirm that with physiology tests, 24 hour physiology tests and an endoscopy. Um, and if people do have proven reflux coming up and affecting the top part of the throat through these methods um, and they're not responding to the medications, the protopal manipulators or the Gaviscon advance and other lifestyle changes, at that point, we might wish to refer them to a specialist upper GI surgeon for consideration of surgery to tighten up the sphincter. This is called a laparoscopic fundoplication. And this has improved a lot over the years as well. Um, one of the most modern methods is using something called a Lynx device, L-I-N-X device, which is a series of magnetic beads, which have the great advantage that they can be tightened or loosened over time uh, and are potentially removable if complications develop. Uh, the other possibility uh, for people who don't want to go quite that far is endoscopic methods by um, specialist gastroenterologists. And, and they can use methods of tightening the sphincter at the bottom of the esophagus, which don't involve external um, operations. These are usually used for people who don't want the medication and have milder symptoms um, and don't want an operation. Or it can be a stepping stone to surgery. For people who have severe reflux, really, they are less effective, but they do remain a therapeutic option. So it's not a simple matter. Diagnosing LPR is not a simple matter. Um, and many people with presumed LPR don't have LPR and need managing in other ways. For example, speech therapy to relax the muscles of, of the throat um, or um, something to manage chronic cough or that is nerve-based, for example. So that can be done with medications or specialists who deal with, with chronic cough. So it's not a simple matter, but for people with nailed on LPR, the mainstay of treatment is medical and failing that, surgical in terms of laparoscopic fundoplication.